Good morning, and welcome to the adult Bible study offered by St. Cloud Presbyterian Church. Today's lesson is called, titled An Argument Against Corruption, and it covers um, Malachi chapter 3. For those of you who'd like to read the scripture ahead, next week's lesson is going to be taken from, um, I'm sorry, this lesson is Micah chapter 3. Next week's lesson will be Malachi chapter 2 and 3. You know, I love America, and I make no apologies for that. I enjoy the freedoms that this country offers to people. But most of all, I enjoy the freedom that we have to worship God in any way we choose. That's guaranteed in the First Amendment. Well, in spite of, a lot of what a lot of politicians believe, I don't believe for a moment that our freedoms come from government. Uh, our freedoms come directly from God, or as Joe Biden says, you know, the thing. The founders of this country got it right when they wrote this in the Declaration of Independence. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And the purpose of government is to protect those God-given rights. And then, like most liberals today, I still believe that the United States is the greatest influence for good in the world. Can you imagine what kind of world we would have if America did not exist? Dinesh D'Souza wrote an excellent book that explores that idea. It's called America, Imagine a World Without Her. <clears throat> I would highly recommend that you read it. Americans have spent a lot of money and lives trying to rid the world of tyrants. And while we were doing that, we were, uh, would never have set out to conquer anyone. After defeating Germany, Japan, and Italy in World War II, these countries were ours for the taking. And what do we do? do we, we didn't oppress them. We paid to rebuild them. No other nation on this planet has ever done that. General Colin Powell <coughs> received, uh, served as Secretary of State with George W. Bush. When he was in England on a fairly large conference, he was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury if our plans for Iraq were just an example of empire building by George Bush. He answered by saying this, Over the years, the United States has sent many of its fine young men and women into great peril to fight for freedom beyond our borders. The only amount of land we have ever asked for in return is enough to bury those that did not return. When he said that, it became so quiet in the room you could hear a pin drop. Liberals claim that we stole this land from the Indians and the Mexicans. <clears throat> well, the fact is the United States paid $15 million for the land that it got from Mexico, and that was a tremendous amount of money back then. As far as the Indians are concerned, they had no concept of land ownership. If they wanted a piece of land, they just went over and killed whoever was there and moved in. To them, they owned whatever land they happened to be occupying at the moment. Now, let's do a little myth-busting here. Did the Dutch really buy Manhattan Island from the Indians for $24 worth of glass beads? And the answer is no. It seems that the Dutch wanted to purchase Manhattan Island, but they didn't know who owned it. And remember, the Indians did not have the same concept of land ownership that the Europeans had. Well, when they went to Manhattan, the first Indians they met were members of the Canarsie tribe, and since they were on Manhattan Island at the time, they asked Chief Seise if, he would, if they could buy the land from him. Now, the Canarsies actually lived in what is known today as South Brooklyn. They just happened to be passing through Manhattan Island uh, when they met up with the Dutch settlers. So the Chief Seise was ready to accept whatever the Dutch offered because Manhattan Island really wasn't his to sell in the first place. So the Dutch didn't put a, pull a scam on Chief Seise. Chief Seise pulled a scam on the Dutch. And he accepted some tools along with some glass beads that were worth about 60 guilders. Those items are sometimes referred to as trinkets, but, which conjures up image of cheap costume jewelry. But we also have to shoot down the myth that these were trinkets. Even though they weren't very valuable to the Europeans, they were items that were extremely helpful to the Indians. The tools were very useful, and the beads were used to make wampum, which the Indians used as currency at that time. Now, how they came up with the sale price of $24 is behind me, because the dollar didn't exist at that time, so that figure had to come out of someone's imagination. Now, remember, the Indians didn't look uh, at land ownership the same way Europeans did. They considered the land to be a god, so they didn't feel that the land could be bought or sold. 
Some historians feel that the Indians thought that they were selling the Europeans the right to hunt on Manhattan. Well, the tribe that occupied most of Manhattan Island was the Wapaker tribe. Well, the tribe that occupied, uh, uh, and they were too happy uh, when the, they weren't too happy when the Dutch showed up and claimed that they owned the land. This led to several bloody battles between the Dutch and the Wappingers. It seemed that the Wappingers didn't think they needed to honor a contact tract that was signed by the Canarsis. So they ended up paying the Wappinger chief a lot more for the land, but it was still a bargain. Now let me ask you, what makes land valuable? Left alone is just a patch of dirt. It's what you do with it that makes it valuable, right? Well, the first European settlers came over here and invested blood, sweat, and tears into this land that the Indians were basically ignoring. They invested a lot of money and, and um, time into making this land what it is today. But today the Me Mexicans and the Indians are saying that we should give the land back to them. But I don't see them offering to pay us back for all the improvements we've made to it. Manhattan Island that was basically worthless when the Dutch settlers bought it from the Indians. In fact, most of the northern part of the island was a swamp. But look at what we've done with it. Land of Manhattan is basically selling for $1,000 a square foot today. <coughs> Rent on Wall Street is the highest in the world at about $3,000 a square foot. And now, 400 years later, these people want it back. It would be like someone selling you a lot, and after you've spent a few thousand, hundred thousand dollars building a house on it, they tell you that you stole it from them and that, they should, that you should give it back to them without any compensation for the improvements you've made. You know, God has richly blessed this country, but that doesn't mean that he'll always bless it. I love America, but I don't particularly love the direction that our government is taking it in today. Liberals seem determined to keep everyone happy except American citizens. Christians are being treated like, like superstitious idiots today. Joe Biden referred to God as the thing, and I don't think that God is particularly happy about it. Will America fall under God's judgment for its offenses against him? And if it does, whose fault do you think that will be? I don't deny that militant Islam is a serious threat to the United States today, and it would become an even greater threat the longer we ignore it. But that's not our biggest threat. I know that we have powerful enemies in the world, but our most powerful enemies are close by. We know that evil exists in the world today, and it's growing stronger every day. But our biggest threat is not coming from the part of the world that you might think it is. I believe that America's biggest threat is coming from within. We have actually elected people to government positions who hate America as it was founded. How is that even possible? As Pogo once said in the funny papers, we has met the enemy and they is us. You see, we are, are our own worst enemies. I am convinced that God is generally displeased with us as a nation. So we may, may not be as bad as some, but God doesn't grade on the curve. He is assigning blame and we must answer. In Micah chapter 3, the prophet is concerned about something. He wants his nation to know that God uh, that is supposed to be served, they're supposed to be serving is not only a God of love, mercy, and grace, he is also a God of judgment. <clears throat> and even though God would much rather continue to bless his people and extend his grace and mercy to them, there does come a time when sin can become so great that God's patience is exhausted. Eventually, God will give a, a nation or an individual exactly what they're demanding. It happened in Noah's day, and it happened again in Sodom and Gomorrah. It even happened to God's own people when they were exiled to Babylon. Do you think that he's going to make an exception for us? Now, Micah is speaking for God when he points a finger at three distinct groups of people and says, it's all your fault. <clears throat> and the three groups are corrupt politicians, compromising preachers, and complacent individuals. Micah desperately wants the people to understand that even though God loves sinners, he still hates their sin, and all unrepentant sin will be judged. His holiness demands it. Thank God that if you truly are truly saved, you will never be judged for your sin. Your sins were judged 2,000 years ago on a cross, and the penalty was paid. But that doesn't mean that we can live careless and haphazard lives. The same Bible that tells us that we will not be judged for our sins also tells us that we will be judged for how, we've, uh, how faithful we've been. Once God has saved us, we will never lose our salvation, but we can lose something 
some or all of our reward, all individuals will be judged, and there is such a thing as the judgment of a nation. That's what Micah was saying in verse 12 of chapter 3. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruin, and the mountain of the house, uh, of the house a wooded height. <coughs> no nation was as pure in its innocence as the nation of Israel. After all, the nation had been created by God himself. Personally, I think you can almost say that, that about uh, the United States as well. But Israel became corrupt, and the vast majority of the people were ignorant of uh, or ind indifferent to the corruption. And because of that, God sent his prophets, like Micah, to call the people to repent and face God's judgment. These prophets tried to tell the people that God would much rather bless them, but they all also need to understand that he's not willing to, uh, he's also willing to punish them if he needs to. I'm trying to stay optimistic about the future of our nation, and at the same time, I think we need to be realistic. And part of loving America is wanting to save it from the corruption that most people seem to be blissfully ignoring, or at the very least, they're indifferent to it. No one is really sure whether Harry Truman said this or not, but it is true, a true t statement no matter who said it. No man can get rich in politics unless he's a crook. It cannot be done. How do you become a multimillionaire on a salary of $174,000 a year? For the eight years that Barack Obama was president, his salary was $400,000 a year for a total of $3.2 million. Where did he get the money to buy a $14 million home on Martha's Vineyard? He sure didn't have it when he took office. When he was running for the Senate, he tried to rent a car and couldn't because his credit card was maxed out and he had no other way to pay for it. Okay, just how did the Jews get to this point? Well, for many generations before Micah showed up, the day-to-day -day activities of the Jews were governed by the law of Moses. But about 800 years before Christ was born, a radical change took place in Israel. <laughs> Prior to that time, Israel was predominantly an agrarian society. In other words, the people were involved in raising animals and growing crops. And in a system like that, the wealth was mostly in property and in goods that were produced and usually bartered. Some people had more than others, but basically the wealth was still pretty evenly distributed. And even in the bad times, the poor uh, people usually had enough to eat and a roof over their heads. And when the times really turned bad, the rich and the uh, poor were pretty much suffering equally. But in Micah's day, Israel had entered the manufacturing age. Matter, modern assembly line techniques were being used in many towns to turn out consumer goods. And as a result, these towns had become one industry, industry towns. As a result of this economic revolution, thousands of the poorer farmers began moving into the cities only to be caught up in the sweatshops. Well, eventually, the law of supply and demand took over, and there weren't enough jobs to go around. This caused wages to go down, and this abundance of cheap labor meant starvation wages for most workers. The wealth of the nation was being concentrated in the hands of a few individuals and the elite class was being formed. Also, as more and more farmers moved into the cities, rich businessmen bought up the land, so it wasn't long before the sweatshop owners controlled the food supply as well. So they could charge exorbitant prices for the food because they were the only store in town, and if you did something that you, they didn't like, they would stop selling you food and you starve. <clears throat> the system also allowed the business owners to make sure that their workers had to give the money they earned right back to them in order to buy food for their families. <laughs> his employer would pay him, and then he would go to the company store to buy what he needed, and he had his pay, handed his pay right back to his employer. That's no better than slavery. And this system of the company store lasted into the 20th century. So, in Micah's day, Jewish society was made up of the very rich and the very poor. For the most part, there was no middle class. And this meant that the rich were free to do whatever they wanted. Sure, they, they were, there was the Mosaic Law, but just like people today, they just ignored the parts of the, God's Word they didn't like. As the years passed, the plight of the poor grew steadily worse. Pol political leaders began to look the other way when the unscrupulous businessmen would exploit the poor. Judges decided cases based on who gave them the biggest bribe. <laughs> 
And it wasn't very long before the priests realized that their livelihoods relied on the donations that were coming from these rich givers. So even the religious leaders seemed unconcerned about the plight of the poor. You know, things really haven't changed all that much today. Why do you think Democrats are in bed with labor unions and Planned Parenthood? It's because the workers pay dues to the unions and the government gives money to Planned Parenthood. Then, part of that money comes back in the form of campaign contributions. It's nothing more than a money laundering scheme. <coughs> Until Trump showed up, there weren't enough jobs to go around. And as more and more people competed for less and less jobs, supply and demand began to drive wages down. Most of the new jobs that were being created in this country under Obama were low-paying part-time jobs. And most of the jobs that were open, or a lot of the jobs, were being taken over by illegal aliens in the country that were willing to work for peanuts. Not only that, it was found that they were tampering with the numbers to make things look better than they actually were. When a person was called back from a layoff, it was counted as a new job. When replacement employees were hired to fill vacant positions, it was counted as a new job. Another problem is a lot of our politicians today are globalists. They invented a world with one central government, and for that to happen, the United States cannot be the only superpower. Globalists believe that America has no right to be so prosperous. So these globalists want to find, bring America in line with the rest of the world. And that would find a way to, for the vision of one world government, and for, with them in charge, by the way. <coughs> Obama saw his job as managing America's decline. He called it the new normal. And even though Obama was telling us that the economy was booming, the job growth wasn't even keeping up with replacement levels. Add to that the population of illegals who work off the books for low wages, which saves workmen's comp and a lot of other expenses, the wages go down. That's why the Washington swamp dwellers hate Trump so much. He's undoing the damage that these globalists have inflicted on the United States for the last quarter century. The economy was booming. But all the gains that were made in the last three years were wiped out by the coronavirus in less than three months. Well, the politicians of Micah's day weren't about to upset the business apple cart either. After all, they were members of the social elite themselves. So it wasn't very long before the religious leaders recognized which side of the bread was buttered and who was buttering it. As a result, the religious leaders started preaching to the collection plate. They began to cater to the rich. Give these religious leaders enough money and they'll say whatever you want them to say. And the rich took full advantage of it. Don't you dare point out their sins. You might offend them and that would mean that they, we'd lose the money they give. So corruption was running rampant throughout Israel and in this sea of sin, God sends his prophets to warn the people of the coming judgment. <coughs> and Micah was among them. Now, Micah's name is really shortened version of the name uh, Micaiah. It means, who was like Yahweh. He was probably identified by his abbreviated version of his name in order to distinguish him from a prophet that was, uh, had the same name who was mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 22. One of the few facts that we know about Micah is that he was born in the small town of Meresheth. It was also known as Moresha. It's, it's located in an area of Israel known as the Shephelah. Meresheth is about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. It lies in the foothills between the coastal plains and the central highlands of Israel. And it's on the border between Israel and Philistia. The nearest city to it is the Philist uh, Philistine city of Gath, which was Goliath's hometown. Unfortunately, because of its location, Meresheth was usually the first area to be attacked whenever someone invaded Israel from the south or the west. The town's still there today. It's known by its Arab name, Marissa. And it's just as insignificant today as it was when uh, Micah was there. In fact, it was, if it wasn't for Micah, no one would even pay attention to it at all. Now, we are told what Micah did for a living, but since Meresheth uh, was an agricultural area, and since Micah seemed to be so concerned about the plight of the common folks, it's probably safe to, under to assume that he was one of them, and, that being the case, he was probably involved in some sort of agriculture. <laughs> Micah was ministering in the southern kingdom of Judah at the same time that Isaiah was there. He was about a hundred years after Elijah, and he was a few years ahead of Amos, a few years after Amos. <clears throat> 
His ministry was also overlapped Hosea's ministry in the northern kingdom, and he was ministering about 50 years before Jeremiah showed up. Well, the religion in Judah didn't impress Micah at all. True religion is not found in the pomp and circumstance of religious ritual. It's found in the little things that we do in our everyday life. But just like many people today, their religion had absolutely no effect at all on the way they lived their lives. See, Micah looked beyond the ritual. He looked into their hearts, and he condemned people who didn't practice what they preached. And he starts by addressing the corrupt politicians. Not long ago, political uh, dramas seemed to be popular on TV. One well-known show was called Scandal. That seems to be an appropriate title for a show about politics. Then it was Madam Secretary. It was supposed to get us ready for the time when Hillary was uh, going to become president. And don't forget the now-canceled West Wing. In those shows, every le uh, leader lies, cheats, and steals in order to further his, his or her own career. Some of the episodes even feature religious leaders who were just as power-hungry and self-centered as the politicians were. That's a case of art uh, imitating life. I'm sure that every one of you can think of a business leader, a politician, or even some religious leaders, past or present, who have been less than honest. In their quest for power, some of them even committed crimes. Now, I'm sure that we can think of leaders who do focus on the best interests of those that, that they represent. And what Lord uh, John Acton said back in the 19th century has always been true. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A young man or woman gets elected to Congress with every intention of doing the things that they promised to do when they were running for the office, and after they've elected, they become enamored with the power they have. After all, the U.S. Congress is one of the most exclusive club clubs in the world. But not long after they arrive in Washington, the swamp dwellers in their party will pay them a little visit. And the conversation goes something like this. Do you like being in Congress? Yeah, it's great. Do you want to be reelected when your term is up? Of course. Well, if you want to have the support of the party and the money that goes along with it, you'll vote the way we tell you to vote. At that point, you have a few key people telling the political sheep what to do and when to do it. That happens less on the Republican side of the aisle. That's why Democrats seem to all vote uh, the same, but it's hard to get Republicans to do that. <clears throat> Don't forget how Nancy Pelosi was using hand signals during the State of the Union speech to tell her sheep when to applaud and when not to. She even got them to dress alike. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, Micah begins by calling these corrupt leaders to listen to what God has to say. And I said, Hear you, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? He begins with the politicians and the businessmen. Micah was talking to the people who made decisions that would affect other people. They were the judges, the political leaders, and the business owners, and he asked them, is it not for you to know justice? In other words, you guys are the leaders of all the people in the world. You should know how to treat people fairly. And at that time, the judges in Judah had started to look the other way with unscrupulous businessmen exploited the poor. <coughs> These leaders imparted their justice to the highest bidder. They didn't decide cases on their merits. They decided cases based on who gave them the biggest bribe. So the rich businessmen didn't care whether they were doing the right thing or not. They simply paid off whatever judge or politician they needed in order to stay out of trouble. You know, things really haven't changed all that much. Politicians are afraid to upset the business apple cart. After all, even the politicians belong to the social elite who feel that the laws they pass don't apply to them. And we all know where the biggest campaign contributions come from. I don't must understand me. I'm not in favor of limiting contributions for political causes. But if our po politicians are truly honest, they wouldn't take money from unscrupulous people. And they wouldn't let money uh, deter them from doing what's right. But whenever one of them is caught in some form of immorality, the first thing they say is, what I do in my private life has nothing at all to do with how I do my job. Remember, that's all we heard coming from Bill Clinton in his fan club when he was caught fooling around with Monica in the back room. <laughs>
He was also caught with witness tampering and lying under oath. He lost his law license because of it. Most people go to jail for less than that. But in the corrupt system of justice we have today, that doesn't apply to a Clinton. That's how Hillary got away with destroying all those subpoenaed emails rather than turning them over like she was supposed to. But when a person does in his private life has everything to do with how they do their job, it speaks of the character. You think a man who will break his marriage vows would think twice about breaking his oath of office? It makes men of integrity to run a country. John Adams said, Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people that is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. When you read through Mal uh, Micah's book, it's almost like listening to the evening news. Back when NBC was a legitimate news outlet, Tom Brokaw used to house a weekly segment called The Fleecing of America. It highlighted the price of government incompetence. I think you would have put Micah's words into the teleprompter and nobody would have noticed the difference. Businessmen don't try to bribe judges anymore, it's just too ri risky. But they do bribe politicians. They do it in the form of campaign, campaign contributions and special favors. In 2007 and 2008, Congressman Charlie Rangel got caught accepting free va Caribbean vacations in return for political favors. Well, at that time, there were still a real, few real journalists around, and when they confronted him with it, he said, I didn't know who was paying for it. Now, if you believe that, I have a nice bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. Most people in excuse me, Congress today have set up nonprofit foundations where money can legally be donated. Then they pay themselves high salaries and have exorbitant expense accounts to siphon the money back out of the foundation and into their pockets. It's all perfectly legal, and that's how these people can become multimillionaires on $174,000 a year. The foundation launders the bribe money that they get. Bernie Sanders has never had a private sector job in his life. He knows nothing at all about running a business, but his net worth is about $2.5 million, and he owns three very expensive homes. They'll use their wealth to fight legitimate claims against them by trying them, uh, tying them up in court for years. In other words, they simply outspend their opponents. On the other hand, the common folks don't seem to be mu uh, much better off. This country is being destroyed by frivolous lawsuits against businesses, and they all arise out of pure greed from people who refuse to accept responsibility for their own actions. Finding something to sue for is considered to be the same as hitting the lottery today. One man in California smoked for 40 years and then blamed the tobacco companies because they, he was dying of lung cancer. As a kid, I can remember cigarettes being referred to as coffin nails. Or how about the woman who spilled coffee in her lap when she tried to drive her car with the coffee be uh, cup between her legs and then sued McDonald's for not telling her that the coffee was hot. Then there's the man that after he injured, was injured by running his bike into a ditch one night, he sued the bike manufacturer for not telling him that he needed to install a light on the bike so that he could see where he was going when the sun went down. Or how about the case of the two teenagers who were struck by lightning in Sequoia National Park and then sued the National Park Service for $1.6 million because they failed to warn the teens not to stand where the lightning would strike them. In 1992, a 23-year-old named Karen Norman got drunk and backed her car into Galveston Bay. Her blood alcohol level was almost twice the legal limit. She was too drunk to get her seatbelt unbuckled, and she drowned. But her friend, who was in the passenger seat, got out with no problem. Well, her family sued Honda and for making a seatbelt that their drunken daughter couldn't unbuckle. In 1991, Richard Harris sued Anheuser-Busch for false advertising. He claimed that he was suffering from emotional distress because when he drank the beer, he didn't have any luck with the ladies like the TV ads had promised he would. He also claimed physical injuries because he didn't like the fact that he would sometimes get sick and throw up and he would fall down after he drank the beer. And let's not forget the burglar who used the homeowner's ladder to climb up to the second story window to break into the house. He claimed that the ladder broke while he was climbing it and he was injured. So he sued the homeowner for having an unsafe ladder lying in his, in his yard. Now tell me, are those legitimate claims? 
or are they lawsuits that are involved by uh, motivated by greed? Claude Glachet of, New of Orleans, Massachusetts, was a very trusted stockbroker. In fact, he was so trusted that dozens of retired people had invested their life savings with him. But suddenly, in December of 1991, he disappeared and took all the client's money with him. Their trust had cost many of his uh, clients every cent they had. Well, in February of 1992, Lockett was arrested in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, none of the money was recovered. And when the police detective asked him why he stole the money from the people who had trusted him, he said, everybody does it. Well, it's that everybody does it attitude that's destroying the very fabric of this country. There was a time when the most precious thing a man had was his reputation. He would pr protect it at all costs. But that's not true anymore. <coughs> Moral integrity seems to be lost today. When immorality takes over a culture, that culture cannot survive for very long. The founding fathers knew this. Remember what John Adams said. The Constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. You now it's interesting to note that God compares the sort of social injustice to cannibalism. It's a case where society is feeding on itself. Look at verses 2 and 3. You who hate God and love evil. It's very hard for a judge who had been out drinking the night before and then drove home in spite of the fact that he was stone cold drunk to go into a courtroom and sentence a drunk driver who had been caught doing exactly the same thing that he had done the night before. And wait until they legalize recreational use of marijuana. Would you want a doctor operating on you who had just been puffing on a marijuana joint? Is a man who was unfaithful to his wife fit to make laws concerning marriage? I don't think so. Our country is becoming more and more immoral because our leaders are becoming more and more immoral. And God places the blame squarely on the shoulders of immoral leaders. Look at verses 2 and 3. You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like a flesh in a cauldron. Michael uses a very harsh illustration here. In other words, he says that the rich were making stew out of the poor. Rich people were feeding on poor people to satisfy their own greed. The point is this, politicians and businessmen don't care about anybody but themselves. They had totally lost touch with the plight of the common man, and people like that should never be allowed to occupy positions of leadership. <coughs> they cared about the plight of the other people as about as much as an unfeeling cannibal does when he's munching on his neighbor's leg. They were totally merciless when it came to the welfare of others. People were just something that were there to be exploited and abandoned. Remember what Marie Antoinette said when she was told that the people had no bread to eat. She said, let them eat cake. She was so removed from the plight of the other people that she actually thought that they had cake to, cake to eat. Michael, Micah tells us in chapter 2 that these people would lay awake at night planning ways to cheat people. Go to those who devise wickedness and work evil on the beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the, their power of their hands. The crazy thing is these people actually thought that God condoned what they were doing. Look at verse 11. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster will come upon us. They felt that as long as they were maintaining the temple, going through the motions of worship, and putting some money in the collection plate, God would protect them regardless of what they did the rest of the time. Verse 4 says that they were receiving no mercy when the time of judgment comes. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. I think it's interesting that Micah says that they will cry out to the Lord. Up until this time, they've been basically ignoring him. But as soon as they get into trouble, who do they cry out to? It's like the people who hate cops, who do they call when they get into trouble? A good example can be seen in the idiot mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot. 
after defunding the police in Chicago and then telling the authorities to not prosecute uh, rioters who had been arrested. When the Black Lives Matter thugs showed up at her house, she told the police chief to surround her house and protect her along with her wife, who was, by the way, born a man. But if John Q. Citizen calls, the police chief says that they had better be prepared to defend themselves <clears throat> because the police no longer have the resources to respond quickly. And in Chicago, if they use a gun to defend themselves, they are the ones who get arrested. Well, God says that it's too late for them to cry out for him, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them. Why? Because they have made their deeds evil. So if you're spending your time cheating people, you now you know what you have to look forward to. Well, here are six requirements for good government leaders. The first requirement is righteousness. We read in Proverbs, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people grieve. And it is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Why is it that when we're selecting leaders, we only seem to look at personality and appearance and ignore morality and qualifications? They vote for the person who promised them the most goodies from the public treasury. Many people are given credit for this quote, but the most, most people uh, seem to favor a Scotsman named Alexander Tyler. Tyler said that democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the majority discovers that it can vote itself largesse out of the public treasury. After that, the majority always votes for the candidate promised the most benefits, with the result that democracy collapses because of a loose physical policy ensuing, always to be followed by a dictatorship, then a monarchy. Second requirement of good government is wisdom. We read in Proverbs chapter 8, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. For I have counsel and sound wisdom, I have insight, I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule and nobles all who govern justly. Third requirement is absolute honesty. We read in Proverbs 18, fine speech is not becoming to a fool, still less is false speech to a prince. In other words, liars should never be made leaders. But I remember when there were some people in the media who said that they admired Bill Clinton because he could lie so well. He could kiss babies at the same time he was stealing their lollipops. The fourth requirement for good government is having good leaders that separate themselves from bad influences. <clears throat> Verse 25 says, Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith will, has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. A good leader must focus on what is right and not just on pressure coming from the public or even lobbyists. He must also surround himself with advisors with good character. But Obama's best buddies were the weather underground terrorists, Bill Ayers, Bernadine Dorn, Kathy Bodine, along with the Hate America preacher, Jeremiah Wright. And his biggest mentor was a card-carrying communist named Frank Marshall Davis, who hated everything America stands for. In fact, there are some who say that Frank Marshall Davis is actually Barack Obama's real father. Could you just imagine the reaction the media would have if a Republican running for office whose biggest mentors were the KKK members? But they're silent when it comes to Obama's background. The fifth requirement is personal purity. <clears throat> Paul said an overseer must be above reproach. A leader must not only avoid evil, he must avoid the appearance of evil. Think about this. If a man is dishonest in his private life, why would you expect him to be honest in his public life? If he isn't faithful to his marriage vows, will he even think twice about violating those piddly little vows of public service? But again, the media is silent about the scandals surrounding Hillary Clinton, Joe, Joe Biden, and Barack Obama. But they make a big deal out of the fact that Mark Rubio got, a, got four speeding tickets in the last 18 years. And the sixth requirement of good government is the protection of the weak and defenseless. Proverbs 31 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. 
Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. A leader is to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. He is to defend those who are defenseless. That's why a good leader should stand up for the unborn. Just because nine unelected people wearing black robes decided that killing unborn babies is legal doesn't make it morally right. Just because our General Assembly votes to put something in the Book of Order doesn't mean that it agrees with God's Word. And people who just stand by and say nothing about it offend God as well. But today the only thing that all politicians seem to be interested in is controlling people. They forget that the government is in place to serve people, not control them. The people are not in place to serve government. The, the whole purpose, and that's the whole purpose of socialized, uh, uh, socialized medicine. If the government controls your health care, they control every aspect of your life. <coughs> they can tell you what to eat, what to wear, where to go, what to drive, if you can own a gun, how you spend your spare time, everything. They can also compel you to do things you don't want to do, and they'll do it in the name of saving health care costs. Same thing is true of the uh, climate change hoax. If they can convince you that we're destroying the planet, they can control everything you do in the name of saving it. We read in Psalm 94, can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute? Okay, look at verse 5. The next group that Micah addresses are the compromising religious leaders. You see, these preachers knew which side of the bread was buttered, and they knew who was buttering it. So they had started to cater to the rich givers. They wouldn't dare do anything that might offend them. So they never condemned the rich for their sinful actions. In fact, by ignoring them, they were giving tacit approval to what they were doing. Notice what verse 5 says. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against them who puts nothing in their mouths. If you pay them enough money, these preachers are there and they will say whatever the congregation wants to hear. Who, who cry peace when they have something to eat? In other words, these preachers wouldn't dare condemn the sins of rich people because they don't want to do anything that would cause them to stop giving. But they wouldn't think twice about condemning a poor person who couldn't do anything for them, but declare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. These men were not doing God's work. They were not proclaiming God's word. They were selling out to the highest bidder. They were preaching peace when the Babylonian army was at the gates. And they did it because that's what the people who paid them wanted to hear. These guys were preaching peace when they should have been condemning these people for their sin and warning them about God's impending judgment. John the Baptist and Jesus called them a brood of vipers. They were nothing more than religious hucksters who were selling themselves to the highest bidder. As far as their uh, ritual was concerned, they were orthodox to the extreme. They had every T crossed and every I dotted. They felt that they were the epitome of godliness. They were using their orthodoxy as an excuse to justify everything they did. They had turned the temple into a good luck charm that was supposed to protect them just because they were there. They felt that as long as the temple was in Jerusalem and they were in the temple, God wouldn't allow anything to happen to Judah. They felt that they were safe as long as the temple was there. In other words, they thought that God was so interested in maintaining his temple that he wasn't going to worry about what they were doing. So they felt that as long as they stayed near the temple, they would be safe. Many people in the church are doing the same thing today. They figure that as long as they keep the church functioning as an institution, and as long as they do all the required rituals, then God would never let anything happen to the United States. In other words, they feel that God is so interested in maintaining his church that he doesn't really care what each individual church member is doing. So they feel that as long as the church is in the United States, God won't allow anything to happen to us. And there are preachers out there who will drag Jesus down to a lower level in order to make him more palatable to the unbelievers in the congregation. They will also ignore any sin they see coming from their biggest givers. They refuse to confront them because they were afraid that they might stop giving. But whenever a preacher tells someone about Christ, he must present Jesus as he is without compromise. And the same applies whenever we, he presents God's word. 
He must never add to it or subtract from it. He must always preach the truth regardless of the cost, and it is vital to our uh, witness that we practice what we preach. Remember, Jesus was never criticized for his miracles or his uh, compassion. <coughs> he was only criticized when he didn't follow the correct procedures. He was criticized when he didn't wash his hands in a proper way. He was criticized for not stopping his disciples from picking a little grain to eat on the Sabbath. And he actually had the nerve to heal a man on the Sabbath. Well, I want you to notice that Micah's warning wasn't uh, directed to wayward Israel. It was directed toward Orthodox Judah. The Judeans felt that they were the epitome of godliness, and they used that, that as an excuse to justify anything that they did, no matter how immoral or unloving it may be. But we must never forget that people are always more in, important than institutions. Well, there has always been the temptation among Christians to rely on their own orthodoxy. Let me illustrate what I mean. In a church in New Mexico, there was a young ministerial student who was doing intern work at a local church. <laughs> Unfortunately, that intern's wife didn't share the same enthusiasm for the ministry that he had, so she left him. Well, the pastor called the young man into his office, but instead of offering support, he demanded his resignation. And what choice did the intern have but to resign? Well, the pastor wasn't satisfied with the letter, his letter, letter of resignation, so he wrote a letter of his own, put the young man's name at the bottom, and then he sent it out to the congregation. At that point, he demanded that the intern simply leave, no farewells, no goodbye gatherings. Well, when the congregation started to question why they hadn't been able to say goodbye to this young man, the pastor had an exorcism to cast out the demons of criticism that he felt had entered his church. This pastor's actions showed a total disregard for the deep need and the pain that this young man was feeling, and he tried to justify his actions based on orthodoxy. After all, didn't Paul say that a minister must manage his own household well? <clears throat> but that man didn't do anything to cause his wife to leave. It's obvious she wasn't a believer. What was he supposed to do, chain her up in the closet? I'm sure that many of you have heard of Dr. Charles Stanley. He's a senior pastor of the First Baptist Church in Atlanta. His TV ministry is called In Touch. Well, he ran, the same, he ran into the same dilemma a few years ago when his wife decided that she no longer wanted to be a pastor's wife, and she divorced him. In that case, he offered to resign, but the church voted to keep him. All of the great leaders in America have always been servant leaders. Now, politically, I'm not a big fan of Harry Truman because he was a liberal Democrat, but Truman wasn't an old-school Democrat. He wasn't the insane Democrat that we see today, and he was an honorable man. One of the greatest qualities that Harry Truman had was the fact that he always saw himself as an ordinary citizen. He never let his position go to his head. No matter what you think of his politics, he always saw his main priority as serving the people who selected him, I mentioned one of my favorite Truman quotes earlier, you get, can't get rich in politics unless you're a crook, it cannot be done. Well, today's church leaders need to take note of that philosophy. Paul told pastors to resist the temptation to think more highly of themselves than they ought to, and I'll, I'll include Sunday school teachers in that group as well. You see, people tend to put pastors on a pedestal, and even though they may resist it at first, eventually they like the view from up there, and before you know it, they think that they deserve to be up there, and they'll end up putting themselves at the center of their ministry and not God. As far as pastors and teachers are concerned, I don't think that God is as interested in where we are as much as he is interested in where we're going. Are we moving forward for him, or are we backpedaling to keep, him, uh, keep from offending someone? In other words, our present is more important than our past. It's like driving a car. What's in the windshield is more important than what's in the rearview mirror. God is not looking at us and comparing us to the people around us. He's looking at us and comparing where we are today to where we were yesterday. <coughs> so there are days when God is more pleased with a recovering drug addict than he is with me. At least a recovering drug addict is making progress. And not only does that apply to preachers and teachers, it really applies to all church members as well, and it also applies to our nation. God's true ministers are to be servants, not kings. They are to lead people like a shepherd leads his flock. 
They are not dignitaries like the sheep are, that the sheep are to adore. They are caregivers who are to love the sheep and do what's best for them. Preachers and teachers who water down the message as found in God's word in order to placate the congregation are an abomination to God. And they don't deserve to stand in the pulpit. Well, what's their fate? Look at verse 6. Therefore it shall be night to you without, vi without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. These self-proclaimed prophets were really nothing more than frauds. Some of them were claiming to have had visions from God. Others were divining their messages by observing natural events and, and interpreting their, what they meant. In other words, they were dabbling in horoscopes and fortune-telling, and these were things that were specifically prohibited by God. The darkness of Micah is referring to is the darkness created by God's absence. There are many pictures of hell in the Bible, but there is none more frightening than the absence of God. <clears throat> the greatest agony that Christ felt on the cross was not the physical pain. It was his separation from the Father. This country has moved into the same position that Judah was in in Micah's day. Historians are trying to rewrite history in order to picture the people who settled this country as narrow-minded, ignorant, bigoted, slave-owning Bible thumpers. Then they try to portray the founding fathers of the United States as people who did everything they could to avoid the involvement with religion. When if you really read the Constitution, you'll say the exact opposite is true. Well, they certainly weren't perfect men. I mean, after all, we're all human. <clears throat> but even the ones who weren't Christians still had a knowledge of, of and a reverence for God's word. Both Yale and Harvard were originally founded to train ministers so that Americans wouldn't be in the dark concerning God. First thing to come out of that newly formed Congress in, the, in this country was an order to have Bibles printed so that they could be used as textbooks in the public schools. And the reason that public schools were even supported was so that everyone in America would be able to read the Bible. The founders of those schools are probably spinning in their graves right now over what's being taught in those schools today. <clears throat> the education centers that were originally formed to be great lights for God in this country have abandoned God long ago. Greed is running rampant. It can be seen in almost every courtroom in the nation. Lawyers and politicians are spending more of, the, of their time trying to figure out ways to get around the law than they are in trying to see that justice is carried out fairly and honestly by the law. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> the seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners shall put, uh, put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. God says that these astrologers and fortune tellers are all going to be put to shame because their predictions aren't going to come true. God's preachers tell it like it is. And they make sure that to the best of their abilities, what they're telling people is the truth. Friends, it's pointless to try to cover up the sins of the church. It's terrible to hear of so many men who are classified as religious leaders who are involved in absolutely reprehensible conduct. And under the guise of Christianity, they are prospering. Penny Hinn is worth $60 million. Kenneth Copeland is worth $760 million. T.D. Jakes is worth $150 million. Pat Robertson is worth $100 million. Joel Osteen is worth $40 million. Caswell Dollar is worth $27 million. And there are thousands more. They will stand in the pulpit and beg you to give them money to their favorite cause, which is ultimately them, but they won't donate any, anything themselves. Well, we need to read Hebrews 12, verse 6 again. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son who is, he receives. <clears throat> well, why does the Lord do that? He does that because he doesn't want us to be illegitimate children. He says, I chasten you and I discipline you so that you can know and the world can know that you are my children. Did you know that William the Conqueror actually signed his name William the Bastard because he was illegitimate? Now, I'm sure that you could, uh, couldn't have made it through the day without knowing that. But I'm convinced that there are a lot of church members today who have signed their name the same way. They might be elders, Sunday school teachers, or even pastors. 
But when all the water boils out of the pot, they have to sign their name like William did because they're illegitimate. <clears throat> their orthodoxy may be correct, but their hearts aren't. They know who Jesus is, but they don't truly know who Jesus. Now, notice that Micah calls uh, these false prophets seers and diviners. Just like in Judah, there is an explosion of occult practices today. Some of them are even creeping into the church. There are over 10 million people in this country today who claim to be witches. They've even managed to get the federal government to recognize Wicca as an official religion and supply army chaplains to the followers. They've also been granted tax-exempt status. They also agreed to place the pentagram, which is the five-pointed star, within the circle around it on military tombstones. And by the way, that is also a recognized symbol for Satan worshipers. Well, don't think for a moment that God isn't noticing all this, because He is. And the judgment that will fall on this country will be the same as the judgment that fell on the people in Micah's day. It will be eternal night, totally cut off from God. Look at verse 8. Mike is very fast to separate himself from these guys. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with the justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. <clears throat> this is about as close as Mike can get to explaining his call. <clears throat> He's comparing himself to the false teachers who were misleading the people. And the big difference was the fact that he had the Holy Spirit helping him, and they didn't. Ezekiel wrote this about these same guys, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Jeremiah wrote, They have spoken falsely of the Lord and have said he will do nothing. No disaster will come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. The prophets will become wind. The word is not in them. They shall be, thus shall it be done to them. Men who are trying to minister without the Holy Spirit are just spouting hot air. You know, it takes a lot of guts to be an unpopular preacher when, who was delivering a message that people hate to hear. But Micah could, be, uh, could do it because, unlike these false prophets, he wasn't uh, motivated by financial gain. And he wasn't infected with the disease of political correctness. So he wasn't worried about being careful to only say what the people wanted to hear. He didn't care about what was happening to him. <clears throat> His only concern was to tell the truth. And he knew that he, he could do this because he allowed the Holy Spirit to control everything he did. This is why he had no problem at all pointing out Israel's sin and warning them of the judgment that was to come. Well, Micah's message to the nation was this. If you don't change your ways, you're going to experience God's judgment. He says, Hear this, you heads of the house of Judah and the rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight who built Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Micah goes back to addressing the same group leaders that he was addressing in verse 1. Well, there were still other sinful activities to mention. In verse 1 he said, Is it not for you to know justice? And in this verse he says that they detest justice. The Hebrew word translated justice in verse 9 is mishpot. It's a legal term that refers to a verdict in a courtroom. So this verse carries the idea of rendering justice, and there are these are the guys who should have been promoting justice, not detesting it. <clears throat> We've destroyed our legal system today by appointing judges who detest our laws and insist on writing law from the bench. Did you know that the Supreme Court was originally created to simply give advice about the constitutionality of the law and make suggestions about how to correct it? They weren't supposed to hear a case where there was no constitutional question. In fact, they didn't even have a place to meet. They had to meet in whatever empty room was available. Have you ever noticed how often radical Democrats turn to judges to get their agenda implemented? They have to because they can't get it passed legally. So they'll judge shop until they find a judge who will ignore the law and rule in their favor. Well, their attitude toward making sure that justice is carried out equally to for everyone that is seen in the, in the word detest is the Hebrew word to'ab, which means loathe. Verse 2 said that they hate the good and love the evil. It's hard to imagine a society where everything is upside down, but we're seeing this reflected more and more in our own society 
Satan is very busy destroying and subverting governments, families, and churches. He wants to make sure that people, uh, God's people suffer. Well, these rulers were his best allies. They were distorting everything that, God, that is good and calling it evil. And they were embracing everything that was evil and calling it good. And then they were saying that God was pleased with them. Their unrighteousness was actually escalated to the point where if the bribes were big enough, they were letting murderers go free. Well, are we doing that today? If I owed as much money to the IRS as Al Shopton, George Soros, and Warren Buffett do, I'd be perp walked into the jail right away. If I cheated on my taxes like Charlie Rangel did, and if I had pulled some of the uh, stunts that Barack Obama and Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton have, I'd be in jail right now. They put Martha Stewart in jail for telling one lie in court, and all she really did was just fail to remember some unimportant fact. Well, Bill Clinton did the same thing, and he has never been charged. And we know that he was genuinely lying. And let's not forget Obama's, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. There's not a word of that was true. <coughs> Hillary Clinton destroyed Sabina uh, information rather than turn it over to the authorities. Bill Clinton is being accused of sexual misconduct, and the claims have been substantiated. Or rather, Joe Biden has been accused of sexual misconduct, and the claims have been uh, substantiated, but nothing is being said about it. But these same people want to destroy Brett Kavanaugh when he was before the Senate to be confirmed by the Supreme Court. But in spite of the fact that the claims of misconduct while he was in college had more holes in it than Swiss cheese, that's all they talked about. Joe Biden even said that Kavanaugh's accuser should be believed regardless of the evidence of the contrary. <coughs> But now that he's being the one being accused, he's singing a different tune. So we're perverting justice like it, just like they did back then. Do you think that God is happy with that? Next, Micah addresses uh, complacent people. In verse 11, its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. The word they in that verse refers to the people. To put a modern twist on that verse, we know that our politicians are corrupt. We know that our preachers are compromising God's word. We know that there are occult practices going on everywhere. But hey, we're in the United States. We're the most powerful nation in the world. We have a Christian heritage. Nothing could possibly happen to us. But remember what Edmund Burke said. The only thing necessary for the triumph to evil, uh, for the, the triumph of evil, is for good men to do nothing. A man named Adolf Hitler came to power because of complacency among the people, and billions died. Complacency can be deadly. When the leadership of a nation, both civil and religious, becomes corrupt, no government in the world will work. That nation is headed for judgment. Don't forget what John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people that's wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Well, what can we do about it? First, we need to live our lives in a godly way, and second, we need to vote. But don't just cast your ballot, be informed. Elect leaders to have integrity. <coughs> we need to elect leaders that will seek to fulfill God's righteous judgment and not just try to line their own pockets. We need to elect leaders based on the qual their qualifications and their integrity, and not based on their gender or their color of their skin, like Kamala Harris was. Okay, so what do we do if corrupt politicians do come to power? Well, we may not be able to totally control that situation, but we should do everything in our power to expose them for what they are. And have you ever considered praying for the people in the government? Ask God to empower the good ones and remove the bad ones. Pray that we will... Be discerning enough to not allow ungodly people to assume a position of leadership. Just sit around, around hoping that uh, the problem will take care of itself isn't going to accomplish anything. And expecting someone else to do it for you is no better. Not voting for a good candidate is the same as voting for the bad one. And sometimes that requires us to vote for the best of, of bad lot. A lot of people didn't vote for Mitt Romney because he was a Mormon. And that's why Obama got into his second term. <laughs> Now don't get me wrong, I'm not a fan of Mitt Romney. 
But because but before the election, I had people ask me what I thought about voting for a Mormon. My answer was, Mormons aren't Christians by any stretch of the imagination, but for the most part, they do tend to be good citizens. <clears throat> From a purely secular perspective, I wouldn't have a problem voting for a Mormon just because he's a Mormon. I didn't say this, but uh, he was certainly better than the alternative. The sad thing is, they, they didn't want a Mormon in the White House, but they were willing to accept an atheist. Does that make sense? Sometimes you do have to vote for the best of a bad lot. At least you get a chance of getting the better of the two. And if you stay home, you deserve what you get. Remember the promise in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We sit by and allow sinful people to run our nation. We can't expect God to bless us. Christians are a huge voting block, but the majority of them stay home on Election Day. Seems that if they don't have a candidate that agrees with everything they believe, they won't vote for anybody. But let me ask you this. What would you really rather have? A guy who agrees with you 75% of the time or a guy who doesn't agree with you at all? <clears throat> Many people have this silly notion that Christians should never be involved in politics. But we don't want to get so heavily minded that we're no earthly good. We have to live in this world. While we're here, we need to be an influence for good. If you refuse to do that, you can't sit around later and wonder why things are getting so bad. Remember what Pogo said, We has met the enemy and they is us. It is true that our nation is facing some serious problems, not the least of which is the idiots in Congress. But sitting around wringing our hands and saying, Woe is me, isn't going to accomplish anything. I've even been told that I should never mention politics in my lessons. Well, I think it's obvious that I ignore them. I mean, if the politics is a good illustration of what I'm teaching, I use it. I'm also not afflicted with a disease of political correctness. Political correctness was invented by college professors to science all, uh, silence all opposition coming from people who tell the truth and point out their error. And today, it has infected the entire nation. Bringing people to Christ is our only hope. Bring people to Christ and you'll change the world. And you don't need to do it alone. Ask God for help. He's more than happy to give it. Ultimately, the hope for America is not found in the White House or the State House. It's also not found in the courthouse. It's found in God's house and God's people. Well, Michael warns us about what will happen if we simply sit around doing nothing. In verse 12, Therefore, because of you, Zion shall plow, be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruin, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. It's not enough for the people of Judah to feel immune to punishment simply because they were God's chosen people. After Micah had pointed out their sins, he ends this chapter with a therefore, and whenever you see the word therefore, you have to find out what it's there for. In other words, you are, he was warning them that they were going to be the consequences for the actions of the crooked politicians and, and the compromising preachers and the complacent people. In their case, God allowed them to be taken captive by the Babylonians. <clears throat> what will happen in our case? I don't know. But remember, God judged the people of Israel. And if he ignores what happened to the, uh, in our country today, he's going to owe the people of Micah's day an apology. And I don't think that's going to happen. God spoke to the people through the prophet Micah and warned them that their spiritual rebellion was going to ultimately lead to their destruction of the nation. That is, unless they turn away from their sin and start to live godly lives. Rebellion and judgment imply that there is an ethical standard to follow, as well as someone who decides whether or not we're meeting that standard. That idea is rejected by a lot of people today. They think that morality is whatever you decide it will be. That's called relativism. They don't think that there is such a thing as absolute truth. In fact, they ridicule the idea that God was re, uh, revealing certain unchanging moral laws <clears throat> and that he is going to hold us accountable if we don't abide by them. I'm the first one to admit that it's hard for God's people to make any headway in a world that is dominated by that sort of thinking. In fact, this is even harder for Christians to be consistent in the application of God's truths in their own lives. For example, in light, on the school, uh, in light of the school system we have today, it's hard for 
parents to teach their children what is right and wrong. It's also impossible to teach children about errors their school expects them to learn. You try to show a child what, that evolution is not true, they'll end up failing the next test because they aren't believing what the school expects them to believe. <clears throat> Imagine that God is the inspector and he is watching our conduct. We make decisions every day that have moral and spiritual ramifications. And our choices are a reflection of how we view God's standards. And in a figurative way, this is what uh, tests our lives. It shows both us and the world what we're made of. Ask yourself this question, am I willing to have God evaluate my behavior by the standard found in his word? Do you think that you would come out shining like gold? My prayer for each of you is that God will give you the grace needed to stand up under his scrutiny and that you'll be the signing light for his glory.